Chapter 8 The Hero in the Age of Checklists We have an opportunity before us, not just in medicine but in virtually any endeavor. Even the most expert among us can gain from searching out the patterns of mistakes and failures and putting a few checks in place. But will we do it? Are we ready to grab onto the idea? It is far from clear. Take the safe surgery checklist. If someone discovered a new drug that could cut down surgical complications with anything remotely like the effectiveness of the checklist, we would have television ads with minor celebrities extolling its virtues. Detail men would offer free lunches to get doctors to make it part of their practice. Government programs would research it. Competitors would jump in to make newer and better versions. If the checklist were a medical device, we would have surgeons clamoring for it, lining up at display booths at surgical conferences to give it a try, hounding their hospital administrators to get one for them because, damn it, doesn't providing good care matter to those pencil pushers. That's what happened when surgical robots came out drool-inducing 22nd century $1.7 million remote-controlled machines designed to help surgeons do laparoscopic surgery with more maneuverability inside patients' bodies and fewer complications. The robots increased surgical costs massively and have so far improved results only modestly for a few operations, compared with standard laparoscopy. Nonetheless, hospitals in the United States and abroad have spent billions of dollars on them. But meanwhile, the checklist? Well, it hasn't been ignored. Since the results of the WHO safe surgery checklist were made public, more than a dozen countries including Australia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, Ecuador, France, Ireland, Jordan, New Zealand, the Philippines, Spain, and the United Kingdom have publicly committed to implementing versions of it in hospitals nationwide. Some are taking the additional step of tracking results, which is crucial for ensuring the checklist is being put in place successfully. In the United States, hospital associations in 20 states have pledged to do the same. By the end of 2009, about 10% of American hospitals had either adopted the checklist or taken steps to implement it, and worldwide more than 2,000 hospitals had. This is all encouraging. Nonetheless, we doctors remain a long way from actually embracing the idea. The checklist has arrived in our operating rooms mostly from the outside in and from the top down. It has come from finger-wagging health officials, who are regarded by surgeons as more or less the enemy, or from jug-eared hospital safety officers, who are about as beloved as the playground safety patrol. Sometimes it is the chief of surgery who brings it in, which means we complain under our breath rather than raise a holy tirade. But it is regarded as an irritation, as interference on our terrain. This is my patient. This is my operating room. And the way I carry out an operation is my business and my responsibility. So who do these people think they are, telling me what to do? Now, if surgeons end up using the checklist anyway, what is the big deal if we do so without joy in our souls? We're doing it. That's what matters, right? Not necessarily. Just ticking boxes is not the ultimate goal here. Embracing a culture of teamwork and discipline is. And if we recognize the opportunity, the two-minute WHO checklist is just a start. It is a single, broad brush device intended to catch a few problems common to all operations, and we surgeons could build on it to do even more. We could adopt, for example, specialized checklists for hip replacement procedures, 
pancreatic operations, aortic aneurysm repairs, examining each of our major procedures for their most common avoidable glitches and incorporating checks to help us steer clear of them. We could even devise emergency checklists, like aviation has, for non-routine situations such as the cardiac arrest my friend John described in which the doctors forgot that an overdose of potassium could be a cause. Beyond the operating room, moreover, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands, of things doctors do that are as dangerous and prone to error as surgery. Take, for instance, the treatment of heart attacks, strokes, drug overdoses, pneumonias, kidney failures, seizures. And consider the many other situations that are only seemingly simpler and less dire the evaluation of a patient with a headache, for example, a funny chest pain, a lung nodule, a breast lump. All involve risk, uncertainty, and complexity and therefore steps that are worth committing to a checklist and testing in routine care. Good checklists could become as important for doctors and nurses as good stethoscopes, which, unlike checklists, have never been proved to make a difference in patient care. The hard question still unanswered is whether medical culture can seize the opportunity. Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff tells the story of our first astronauts and charts the demise of the Maverick, Chuck Yeager test pilot culture of the 1950s. It was a culture defined by how unbelievably dangerous the job was. Test pilots strapped themselves into machines of barely controlled power and complexity, and a quarter of them were killed on the job. The pilots had to have focus, daring, wits, and an ability to improvise the right stuff. But as knowledge of how to control the risks of flying accumulated as checklists and flight simulators became more prevalent and sophisticated the danger diminished, values of safety and conscientiousness prevailed, and the rock star status of the test pilots was gone. Something like this is going on in medicine. We have the means to make some of the most complex and dangerous work we do in surgery, emergency care, ICU medicine, and beyond more effective than we ever thought possible. But the prospect pushes against the traditional culture of medicine, with its central belief that in situations of high risk and complexity what you want is a kind of expert audacity the right stuff, again. Checklists and standard operating procedures feel like exactly the opposite, and that's what rankles many people. It's ludicrous, though, to suppose that checklists are going to do away with the need for courage, wits, and improvisation. The work of medicine is too intricate and individual for that, good clinicians will not be able to dispense with expert audacity. Yet we should also be ready to accept the virtues of regimentation. And it is true well beyond medicine. The opportunity is evident in many fields and so also is the resistance. Finance offers one example. Recently, I spoke to Mohnish Pabrai, managing partner in Pabrai Investment Funds in Irvine, California. He is one of three investors I've recently met who have taken a page from medicine and aviation to incorporate formal checklists into their work. All three are huge investors, Pabrai runs a $500 million portfolio, Guy Spire is head of Aquamarine Capital Management in Zurich, Switzerland, a $70 million fund. The third did not want to be identified by name or to reveal the size of the fund where he is a director, but it is one of the biggest in the world and worth billions. The three consider themselves value investors investors who buy shares in under-recognized, undervalued companies. They don't time the market. They don't buy according to some computer algorithm. 
they do intensive research, look for good deals, and invest for the long run. They aim to buy Coca-Cola before everyone realizes it's going to be Coca-Cola. Have I described what this involves? Over the last 15 years, he's made a new investment or two per quarter, and he's found it requires in-depth investigation of 10 or more prospects for each one he finally buys stock in. The ideas can bubble up from anywhere a billboard advertisement, a newspaper article about real estate in Brazil, a mining journal he decides to pick up for some random reason. He reads broadly and looks widely. He has his eyes open for the glint of a diamond in the dirt, of a business about to boom. He hits upon hundreds of possibilities but most drop away after cursory examination. Every week or so, though, he spots one that starts his pulse racing. It seems surefire. He can't believe no one else has caught onto it yet. He begins to think it could make him tens of millions of dollars if he plays it right, no, this time maybe hundreds of millions. You go into greed mode, he said. Guy Spire called it cocaine brain. Neuroscientists have found that the prospect of making money stimulates the same primitive reward circuits in the brain that cocaine does. And that, Pabre I said, is when serious investors like himself try to become systematic. They focus on dispassionate analysis, on avoiding both irrational exuberance and panic. They pour over the company's financial reports, investigate its liabilities and risks, examine its management team's track record, weigh its competitors, consider the future of the market it is in trying to gauge both the magnitude of opportunity and the margin of safety. The patron saint of value investors is Warren Buffett, among the most successful financiers in history and one of the two richest men in the world, even after the losses he suffered in the crash of 2008. Pabre I has studied every deal Buffett and his company, Berkshire Hathaway, have made good or bad and read every book he could find about them. He even pledged $650,000 at a charity auction to have lunch with Buffett. Warren Pabre I said and after a $650,000 lunch, I guess first names are in order Warren uses a mental checklist process when looking at potential investments. So that's more or less what Pabre I did from his fund's inception. He was disciplined. He made sure to take his time when studying a company. The process could require weeks. And he did very well following this method but not always, he found. He also made mistakes, some of them disastrous. These were not mistakes merely in the sense that he lost money on his bets or missed making money on investments he'd rejected. That's bound to happen. Risk is unavoidable in Pabrei's line of work. No. These were mistakes in the sense that he had miscalculated the risks involved, made errors of analysis. For example, looking back, he noticed that he had repeatedly erred in determining how leveraged companies were how much cash was really theirs, how much was borrowed, and how risky those debts were. The information was available, he just hadn't looked for it carefully enough. In large part, he believes, the mistakes happened because he wasn't able to damp down the cocaine brain. Pabre I is a 45-year-old former engineer. He comes from India, where he clawed his way up its fiercely competitive educational system. Then he secured admission to Clemson University, in South Carolina, to study engineering. From there he climbed the ranks of technology companies in Chicago and California. Before going into investment, 
he built a successful informational technology company of his own. All this is to say he knows a thing or two about being dispassionate and avoiding the lure of instant gratification. Yet no matter how objective he tried to be about a potentially exciting investment, he said, he found his brain working against him, latching onto evidence that confirmed his initial hunch and dismissing the signs of a downside. It's what the brain does. You get seduced, he said. You start cutting corners. Or, in the midst of a bear market, the opposite happens. You go into fear mode, he said. You see people around you losing their bespoke shirts, and you overestimate the dangers. He also found he made mistakes in handling complexity. A good decision requires looking at so many different features of companies in so many ways that, even without the cocaine brain, he was missing obvious patterns. His mental checklist wasn't good enough. I am not Warren, he said. I don't have a 300 IQ. He needed an approach that could work for someone with an ordinary IQ. So he devised a written checklist. Apparently, Buffett himself could have used one. Pabre I noticed that even he made certain repeated mistakes. That's when I knew he wasn't really using a checklist, Pabre I said. So Pabre I made a list of mistakes he'd seen once Buffett and other investors had made as well as his own. It soon contained dozens of different mistakes, he said. Then, to help him guard against them, he devised a matching list of checks about 70 in all. One, for example, came from a Berkshire Hathaway mistake he'd studied involving the company's purchase in early 2000 of Court Furniture, a Virginia-based rental furniture business. Over the previous 10 years, Court's business and profits had climbed impressively. Charles Munger, Buffett's longtime investment partner, believed Court was riding a fundamental shift in the American economy. The business environment had become more and more volatile and companies therefore needed to grow and shrink more rapidly than ever before. As a result, they were increasingly apt to lease office space rather than buy it and, Munger noticed, to lease the furniture, too. Court was in a perfect position to benefit. Everything else about the company was measuring up it had solid financials, great management, and so on. So Munger bought. But buying was an error. He had missed the fact that the three previous years of earnings had been driven entirely by the dot-com boom of the late 90s. Court was leasing furniture to hundreds of startup companies that suddenly stopped paying their bills and evaporated when the boom collapsed. Munger and Buffett saw the dot-com bubble a mile away, Pabre I said. These guys were completely clear. But they missed how dependent Court was on it. Munger later called his purchase a macroeconomic mistake. Court's earning power basically went from substantial to zero for a while, he confessed to his shareholders. So Pabre I added the following checkpoint to his list, when analyzing a company, stop and confirm that you've asked yourself whether the revenues might be overstated or understated due to boom or bust conditions. Like him, the anonymous investor I spoke to I'll call him Cook made a checklist. But he was even more methodical, he enumerated the errors known to occur at any point in the investment process during the research phase, during decision making, during execution of the decision, and even in the period after making an investment when one should be monitoring for problems. He then designed detailed checklists to avoid the errors, complete with clearly identified pause points at which he and his investment team would run through the items. 
he has a day three checklist, for example, which he and his team review at the end of the third day of considering an investment. By that point, the checklist says, they should confirm that they have gone over the prospect's key financial statements for the previous 10 years, including checking for specific items in each statement and possible patterns across the statements. It's easy to hide in a statement. It's hard to hide between statements, Cook said. One check, for example, requires the members of the team to verify that they've read the footnotes on the cash flow statements. Another has them confirm they've reviewed the statement of key management risks. A third asks them to make sure they've looked to see whether cash flow and costs match the reported revenue growth. This is basic basic basic, he said. Just look. You'd be amazed by how often people don't do it. Consider the Enron debacle, he said. People could have figured out it was a disaster entirely from the financial statements. He told me about one investment he looked at that seemed a huge winner. The cocaine brain was screaming. It turned out, however, that the company's senior officers, who'd been selling prospective investors on how great their business was, had quietly sold every share they owned. The company was about to tank and buyers jumping aboard had no idea. But Cook had put a check on his three-day list that ensured his team had reviewed the fine print of the company's mandatory stock disclosures, and he discovered the secret. 49 times out of 50, he said, there's nothing to be found. But then there is. The checklist doesn't tell him what to do, he explained. It is not a formula. But the checklist helps him be as smart as possible every step of the way, ensuring that he's got the critical information he needs when he needs it, that he's systematic about decision making, that he's talked to everyone he should. With a good checklist in hand, he was convinced he and his partners could make decisions as well as human beings are able. And as a result, he was also convinced they could reliably beat the market. I asked him whether he wasn't fooling himself. Maybe, he said. But he put it in surgical terms for me. When surgeons make sure to wash their hands or to talk to everyone on the team he'd seen the surgery checklist they improve their outcomes with no increase in skill. That's what we are doing when we use the checklist. Cook would not discuss precise results his fund does not disclose its earnings publicly but he said he had already seen the checklist deliver better outcomes for him. He had put the checklist process in place at the start of 2008 and, at a minimum, it appeared that he had been able to ride out the subsequent economic collapse without disaster. Others say his fund has done far better than that, outperforming its peers. How much of any success can be directly credited to the checklist is not clear after all, he's used it just two years so far. What Cook says is certain, however, was that in a period of enormous volatility the checklist gave his team at least one additional and unexpected edge over others, efficiency. When he first introduced the checklist, he assumed it would slow his team down, increasing the time and work required for their investment decisions. He was prepared to pay that price. The benefits of making fewer mistakes seemed obvious. And in fact, using the checklist did increase the upfront work time. But to his surprise, he found they were able to evaluate many more investments in far less time overall. Before the checklist, Cook said, it sometimes took weeks and multiple meetings to sort out how seriously they should consider a candidate investment whether they should drop it or pursue a more in-depth investigation. 
The process was open-ended and haphazard, and when people put a month into researching an investment, they tended to get, well, invested. After the checklist, though, he and his team found that they could consistently sort out by the three-day check which prospects really deserved further consideration and which ones didn't. The process was more thorough but faster, he said. It was one hit, and we could move on. Pavre I. and Spire, the Zurich investor, found the same phenomenon. Spire used to employ an investment analyst. But I didn't need him anymore, he said. Pavre I. had been working with the checklist for about a year. His fund was up more than 100% since then. This could not possibly be attributed to just the checklist. With the checklist in place, however, he observed that he could move through investment decisions far faster and more methodically. As the markets plunged through late 2008 and stockholders dumped shares in panic, there were numerous deals to be had and in a single quarter he was able to investigate more than a hundred companies and add ten to his fund's portfolios. Without the checklist, Pavre I said, he could not have gotten through a fraction of the analytic work or have had the confidence to rely on it. A year later, his investments were up more than 160% on average. He'd made no mistakes at all. What makes these investors' experiences striking to me is not merely their evidence that checklists might work as well in finance as they do in medicine. It's that here, too, they have found takers slow to come. In the money business, everyone looks for an itch. If someone is doing well, people pounce like starved hyenas to find out how. Almost every idea for making even slightly more money investing in internet companies, buying trans-CHES of sliced-up mortgages, whatever gets sucked up by the giant maw almost instantly. Every idea, that is, except one, checklists. I asked Cook how much interest others have had in what he has been doing these past two years. Zero he said or actually that's not quite true. People have been intensely interested in what he's been buying and how, but the minute the word checklist comes out of his mouth, they disappear. Even in his own firm, he's found it a hard sell. I got pushback from everyone. It took my guys months to finally see the value, he said. To this day, his partners still don't all go along with his approach and don't use the checklist in their decisions when he's not involved. I find it amazing other investors have not even bothered to try, he said. Some have asked. None have done it. The resistance is perhaps an inevitable response. Some years ago, Jeff Smart, a PhD psychologist who was then at Claremont Graduate University, conducted a revealing research project. He studied 51 venture capitalists, people who make gutsy, high-risk, multi-million dollar investments in unproven startup companies. Their work is quite unlike that of money managers like Pabre I and Cook and Spire, who invest in established companies with track records and public financial statements one can analyze. Venture capitalists bet on wild-eyed, greasy-haired, underaged entrepreneurs pitching ideas that might be little more than scribbles on a sheet of paper or a clunky prototype that barely works. But that's how Google and Apple started out, and the desperate belief of venture capitalists is that they can find the next equivalent and own it. Smart specifically studied how such people made their most difficult decision in judging whether to give an entrepreneur money or not. You would think that this would be whether the entrepreneur's idea is actually a good one. 
but finding a good idea is apparently not all that hard. Finding an entrepreneur who can execute a good idea is a different matter entirely. One needs a person who can take an idea from proposal to reality, work the long hours, build a team, handle the pressures and setbacks, manage technical and people problems alike, and stick with the effort for years on end without getting distracted or going insane. Such people are rare and extremely hard to spot. Smart identified half a dozen different ways the venture capitalists he studied decided whether they'd found such a person. These were styles of thinking, really. He called one type of investor the art critics. They assessed entrepreneurs almost at a glance, the way an art critic can assess the quality of a painting intuitively and based on long experience. Sponges took more time gathering information about their targets, soaking up whatever they could from interviews, on-site visits, references, and the like. Then they went with whatever their guts told them. As one such investor told Smart, he did due diligence by mucking around. The prosecutors interrogated entrepreneurs aggressively, testing them with challenging questions about their knowledge and how they would handle random hypothetical situations. Suitors focused more on wooing people than on evaluating them. Terminators saw the whole effort as doomed to failure and skipped the evaluation part. They simply bought what they thought were the best ideas, fired entrepreneurs they found to be incompetent, and hired replacements. Then there were the investors smart called the airline captains. They took a methodical, checklist-driven approach to their task. Studying past mistakes and lessons from others in the field, they built formal checks into their process. They forced themselves to be disciplined and not to skip steps, even when they found someone they knew intuitively was a real prospect. Smart next tracked the venture capitalist's success over time. There was no question which style was most effective and by now you should be able to guess which one. It was the airline captain, hands down. Those taking the checklist-driven approach had a 10% likelihood of later having to fire senior management for incompetence or concluding that their original evaluation was inaccurate. The others had at least a 50% likelihood. The results showed up in their bottom lines, too. The airline captains had a median 80% return on the investments studied, the others 35% or less. Those with other styles were not failures by any stretch experience does count for something. But those who added checklists to their experience proved substantially more successful. The most interesting discovery was that, despite the disadvantages, most investors were either art critics or sponges intuitive decision makers instead of systematic analysts. Only one in eight took the airline captain approach. Now, maybe the others didn't know about the airline captain approach. But even knowing seems to make little difference. Smart published his findings more than a decade ago. He has since gone on to explain them in a best-selling business book on hiring called Who. But when I asked him, now that the knowledge is out, whether the proportion of major investors taking the more orderly, checklist-driven approach has increased substantially, he could only report, no. It's the same. We don't like checklists. They can be painstaking. They're not much fun. But I don't think the issue here is mere laziness. There's something deeper, more visceral going on when people walk away not only from saving lives but from making money. It somehow feels beneath us to use a checklist, an embarrassment.
it runs counter to deeply held beliefs about how the truly great among us those we aspire to be handle situations of high stakes and complexity. The truly great are daring. They improvise. They do not have protocols and checklists. Maybe our idea of heroism needs updating. On January 14, 2009, whose safe surgery checklist was made public. As it happened, the very next day, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia Airport in New York City with 155 people on board, struck a large flock of Canadian geese over Manhattan, lost both engines, and famously crash-landed in the icy Hudson River. The fact that not a single life was lost led the press to christen the incident the miracle on the Hudson. A National Transportation Safety Board official said the flight has to go down as the most successful ditching in aviation history. 57-year-old Captain Chesley B. Sully Sullenberger III, a former Air Force pilot with 20,000 hours of flight experience, was hailed the world over. Quiet air hero is Captain America, shouted the New York Post headline. ABC News called him the Hudson River hero. The German papers hailed Der Held von New York, the French Le Nouveau Heroes de l'Amérique, the Spanish language press El Hero de Nueva York. President George W. Bush phoned Sullenberger to thank him personally, and President-elect Barack Obama invited him and his family to attend his inauguration five days later. Photographers tore up the lawn of his Danville, California, home trying to get a glimpse of his wife and teenage children. He was greeted with a hometown parade and a $3 million book deal. But as the details trickled out about the procedures and checklists that were involved, the fly-by-wire computer system that helped control the glide down to the water, the co-pilot who shared flight responsibilities, the cabin crew who handled the remarkably swift evacuation, we the public started to become uncertain about exactly who the hero here was. As Sullenberger kept saying over and over from the first of his interviews afterward, I want to correct the record right now. This was a crew effort. The outcome, he said, was the result of teamwork and adherence to procedure as much as of any individual skill he may have had. Ah, that's just the modesty of the quiet hero, we finally insisted. The next month, when the whole crew of five not just Sullenberger was brought out to receive the keys to New York City, for exclusive interviews on every network, and for a standing ovation by an audience of 70,000 at the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay, you could see the press had already determined how to play this. They didn't want to talk about teamwork and procedure. They wanted to talk about Sully using his experience flying gliders as an Air Force Academy cadet. That was so long ago, Sullenberger said, and those gliders are so different from a modern jet airliner. I think the transfer of experience was not large. It was as if we simply could not process the full reality of what had been required to save the people on that plane. The aircraft was a European-built Airbus A320 with two jet engines, one on each wing. The plane took off at 3.25 p.m. on a cold but clear afternoon, headed for Charlotte, North Carolina, with First Officer Jeffrey Skiles at the controls and Sullenberger serving as the pilot not flying. The first thing to note is that the two had never flown together before that trip. Both were tremendously experienced. Skiles had nearly as many flight hours as Sullenberger and had been a long-time Boeing 737 captain until downsizing had forced him into the right-hand seat and retraining to fly A320S. This much experience may sound like a good thing, 
but it isn't necessarily. Imagine two experienced but unacquainted lawyers meeting to handle your case on your opening day in court. Or imagine two top basketball coaches who are complete strangers stepping onto the parquet to lead a team in a championship game. Things could go fine, but it is more likely that they will go badly. Before the pilots started the plane's engines at the gate, however, they adhered to a strict discipline the kind most other professions avoid. They ran through their checklists. They made sure they'd introduced themselves to each other and the cabin crew. They did a short briefing, discussing the plan for the flight, potential concerns, and how they'd handle troubles if they ran into them. And by adhering to this discipline by taking just those few short minutes they not only made sure the plane was fit to travel but also transformed themselves from individuals into a team, one systematically prepared to handle whatever came their way. I don't think we recognize how easy it would have been for Sullenberger and Skiles to have blown off those preparations, to have cut corners that day. The crew had more than 150 total years of flight experience 150 years of running their checklists over and over and over, practicing them in simulators, studying the annual updates. The routine can seem pointless most of the time. Not once had any of them been in an airplane accident. They fully expected to complete their careers without experiencing one, either. They considered the odds of anything going wrong extremely low, far lower than we do in medicine or investment or legal practice or other fields. But they ran through their checks anyway. It need not have been this way. As recently as the 1970s, some airline pilots remained notoriously bluff about their preparations, however carefully designed. I've never had a problem, they would say. Or let's get going. Everything's fine. Or I'm the captain. This is my ship. And you're wasting my time. Consider, for example, the infamous 1977 Tenerife disaster. It was the deadliest accident in aviation history. Two Boeing 747 airliners collided at high speed in fog on a Canary Islands runway, killing 583 people on board. The captain on one of the planes, a KLM flight, had misunderstood air traffic control instructions conveying that he was not cleared for takeoff on the runway and disregarded the second officer, who recognized that the instructions were unclear. There was in fact a Pan American flight taking off in the opposite direction on the same runway. Is he not cleared, that Pan American, the second officer said to the captain. Oh yes, the captain insisted, and continued onto the runway. The captain was wrong. The second officer sensed it. But they were not prepared for this moment. They had not taken the steps to make themselves a team. As a result, the second officer never believed he had the permission, let alone the duty, to halt the captain and clear up the confusion. Instead the captain was allowed to plow ahead and kill them all. The fear people have about the idea of adherence to protocol is rigidity. They imagine mindless automatons, heads down in a checklist, incapable of looking out their windshield and coping with the real world in front of them. But what you find, when a checklist is well made, is exactly the opposite. The checklist gets the dumb stuff out of the way, the routines your brain shouldn't have to occupy itself with, are the elevator controls set? Did the patient get her antibiotics on time? Did the managers sell all their shares? Is everyone on the same page here, and lets it rise above to focus on the hard stuff, where should we land? 
Here are the details of one of the sharpest checklists I've seen, a checklist for engine failure during flight in a single-engine Cessna airplane The U.S. Airways situation, only with a solo pilot. It is slimmed down to six key steps not to miss for restarting the engine, steps like making sure the fuel shut-off valve is in the open position and putting the backup fuel pump switch on. But step one on the list is the most fascinating. It is simply, fly the airplane. Because pilots sometimes become so desperate trying to restart their engine, so crushed by the cognitive overload of thinking through what could have gone wrong, they forget this most basic task. Fly the airplane. This isn't rigidity. This is making sure everyone has their best shot at survival. About 90 seconds after takeoff, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 was climbing up through 3,000 feet when it crossed the path of the geese. The plane came upon the geese so suddenly Sullenberger's immediate reaction was to duck. The sound of the birds hitting the windshield and the engines was loud enough to be heard on the cockpit voice recorder. As news reports later pointed out, planes have hit hundreds of thousands of birds without incident. But dual bird strikes are rare. And, in any case, jet engines are made to handle most birds, more or less liquefying them. Canadian geese, however, are larger than most birds, often 10 pounds and up, and no engine can handle them. Jet engines are designed instead to shut down after ingesting one, without exploding or sending metal shrapnel into the wings or the passengers on board. That's precisely what the A320S engines did when they were hit with the rarest of rare situations at least three geese in the two engines. They immediately lost power. Once that happened, Sullenberger made two key decisions, first, to take over flying the airplane from his co-pilot, Skiles, and, second, to land in the Hudson. Both seemed clear choices at the time and were made almost instinctively. Within a minute it became apparent that the plane had too little speed to make it to LaGuardia or to the runway in Teterboro, New Jersey, offered by air traffic control. As for taking over the piloting, both he and Skiles had decades of flight experience, but Sullenberger had logged far more hours flying the A320. All the key landmarks to avoid hitting Manhattan skyscrapers, the George Washington Bridge were out his left side window. And Skiles had also just completed A320 emergency training and was more recently familiar with the checklists they would need. My aircraft, Sullenberger said, using the standard language as he put his hands on the controls. Your aircraft, Skiles replied. There was no argument about what to do next, not even a discussion and there was no need for one. The pilots' preparations had made them a team. Sullenberger would look for the nearest, safest possible landing site. Skiles would go to the engine failure checklists and see if he could relight the engines. But for the computerized voice of the ground proximity warning system saying pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up, the cockpit was virtually silent as each pilot concentrated on his tasks and observed the other for cues that kept them coordinated. Both men played crucial roles here. We treat copilots as if they are superfluous backups who are given a few tasks so that they have something to do. But given the complexity of modern airplanes, they are as integral to a successful flight as anesthesiologists are to a successful operation. Pilot and co-pilot alternate taking the flight controls and managing the flight equipment and checklist responsibilities, and when things go wrong it's not at all clear which is the harder job. 
the plane had only three and a half minutes of glide in it. In that time, Skiles needed to make sure he'd done everything possible to relight the engines while also preparing the aircraft for ditching if it wasn't feasible. But the steps required just to restart one engine typically take more time than that. He had some choices to make. Plunging out of the sky, he judged that their best chance at survival would come from getting an engine restarted. So he decided to focus almost entirely on the engine failure checklist and running through it as fast as he could. The extent of damage to the engines was unknown, but regaining even partial power would have been sufficient to get the plane to an airport. In the end, Skiles managed to complete a restart attempt on both engines, something investigators later testified to be very remarkable in the time frame he had and something they found difficult to replicate in simulation. Yet he did not ignore the ditching procedure, either. He did not have time to do everything on the checklist. But he got the distress signals sent, and he made sure the plane was properly configured for an emergency water landing. Flaps out, asked Sullenberger. Got flaps out, responded Skiles. Sullenberger focused on the glide down to the water. But even in this, he was not on his own. For, as journalist and pilot William Langwiesha noted afterward, the plane's fly-by-wire control system was designed to assist pilots in accomplishing a perfect glide without demanding unusual skills. It eliminated drift and wobble. It automatically coordinated the rudder with the roll of the wings. It gave Sullenberger a green dot on his screen to target for optimal descent. And it maintained the ideal angle to achieve lift, while preventing the plane from accidentally reaching radical angles during flight that would have caused it to lose its gliding ability. The system freed him to focus on other critical tasks, like finding a landing site near ferries in order to give passengers their best chance of rescue and keeping the wings level as the plane hit the water's surface. Meanwhile, the three flight attendants in the cabin Sheila Dale, Donna Dent, and Doreen Welsh followed through on their protocols for such situations. They had the passengers put their heads down and grab their legs to brace for impact. Upon landing and seeing water through the windows, the flight attendants gave instructions to don life vests. They made sure the doors got open swiftly when the plane came to a halt, that passengers didn't waste time grabbing for their belongings, or trap themselves by inflating life vests inside the aircraft. Welsh, stationed in the very back, had to wade through ice-cold, chest-high water leaking in through the torn fuselage to do her part. Just two of the four exits were safely accessible. Nonetheless, Working together they got everyone out of a potentially sinking plane in just three minutes exactly as designed. While the evacuation got underway, Sullenberger headed back to check on the passengers and the condition of the plane. Meanwhile, Skiles remained up in the cockpit to run the evacuation checklist making sure potential fire hazards were dealt with, for instance. Only when it was completed did he emerge. The arriving flotilla of ferries and boats proved more than sufficient to get everyone out of the water. Air in the fuel tanks, which were only partly full, kept the plane stable and afloat. Sullenberger had time for one last check of the plane. He walked the aisle to make sure no one had been forgotten, and then he exited himself. The entire event had gone shockingly smoothly. After the plane landed, Sullenberger said, First Officer Jeff Skiles and I turned to each other and, almost in unison, at the same time, with the same words, said to each other, Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. 
so who was the hero here? No question, there was something miraculous about this flight. Luck played a huge role. The incident occurred in daylight, allowing the pilots to spot a safe landing site. Plenty of boats were nearby for quick rescue before hypothermia set in. The bird strike was sufficiently high to let the plane clear the George Washington Bridge. The plane was also headed downstream, with the current, instead of upstream or over the ocean, limiting damage on landing. Nonetheless, even with fortune on their side, there remained every possibility that 155 lives could have been lost that day. But what rescued them was something more exceptional, difficult, crucial, and, yes, heroic than flight ability. The crew of U.S. Airways Flight 1549 showed an ability to adhere to vital procedures when it mattered most, to remain calm under pressure, to recognize where one needed to improvise and where one needed not to improvise. They understood how to function in a complex and dire situation. They recognized that it required teamwork and preparation and that it required them long before the situation became complex and dire. This was what was unusual. This is what it means to be a hero in the modern era. These are the rare qualities that we must understand are needed in the larger world. All learned occupations have a definition of professionalism, a code of conduct. It is where they spell out their ideals and duties. The codes are sometimes stated, sometimes just understood. But they all have at least three common elements. First is an expectation of selflessness that we who accept responsibility for others whether we are doctors, lawyers, teachers, public authorities, soldiers, or pilots will place the needs and concerns of those who depend on us above our own. Second is an expectation of skill, that we will aim for excellence in our knowledge and expertise. Third is an expectation of trustworthiness, that we will be responsible in our personal behavior toward our charges. Aviators, however, add a fourth expectation, discipline, discipline in following prudent procedure and in functioning with others. This is a concept almost entirely outside the lexicon of most professions, including my own. In medicine, we hold up autonomy as a professional lodestar, a principle that stands in direct opposition to discipline. But in a world in which success now requires large enterprises, teams of clinicians, high-risk technologies, and knowledge that outstrips any one person's abilities, individual autonomy hardly seems the ideal we should aim for. It has the ring more of protectionism than of excellence. The closest our professional codes come to articulating the goal is an occasional plea for collegiality. What is needed, however, isn't just that people working together be nice to each other. It is discipline. Discipline is hard harder than trustworthiness and skill and perhaps even than selflessness. We are by nature flawed and inconstant creatures. We can't even keep from snacking between meals. We are not built for discipline. We are built for novelty and excitement, not for careful attention to detail. Discipline is something we have to work at. That's perhaps why aviation has required institutions to make discipline a norm. The pre-flight checklist began as an invention of a handful of army pilots in the 1930s, but the power of their discovery gave birth to entire organizations. In the United States, we now have the National Transportation Safety Board to study accidents to independently determine the underlying causes and recommend how to remedy them. 
and we have national regulations to ensure that those recommendations are incorporated into usable checklists and reliably adopted in ways that actually reduce harm. To be sure, checklists must not become ossified mandates that hinder rather than help. Even the simplest requires frequent revisitation and ongoing refinement. Airline manufacturers put a publication date on all their checklists, and there is a reason why they are expected to change with time. In the end, a checklist is only an aid. If it doesn't aid, it's not right. But if it does, we must be ready to embrace the possibility. We have most readily turned to the computer as our aid. Computers hold out the prospect of automation as our bulwark against failure. Indeed, they can take huge numbers of tasks off our hands, and thankfully already have tasks of calculation, processing, storage, transmission. Without question, technology can increase our capabilities. But there is much that technology cannot do, deal with the unpredictable, manage uncertainty, construct a soaring building, perform a life-saving operation. In many ways, technology has complicated these matters. It has added yet another element of complexity to the systems we depend on and given us entirely new kinds of failure to contend with. One essential characteristic of modern life is that we all depend on systems on assemblages of people or technologies or both and among our most profound difficulties is making them work. In medicine, for instance, if I want my patients to receive the best care possible, not only must I do a good job but a whole collection of diverse components have to somehow mesh together effectively. Healthcare is like a car that way, points out Donald Barrick, president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston and one of our deepest thinkers about systems in medicine. In both cases, having great components is not enough. We're obsessed in medicine with having great components the best drugs, the best devices, the best specialists but pay little attention to how to make them fit together well. Barrick notes how wrong-headed this approach is. Anyone who understands systems will know immediately that optimizing parts is not a good route to system excellence, he says. He gives the example of a famous thought experiment of trying to build the world's greatest car by assembling the world's greatest car parts. We connect the engine of a Ferrari, the brakes of a Porsche, the suspension of a BMW, the body of a Volvo. What we get, of course, is nothing close to a great car, we get a pile of very expensive junk. Nonetheless, in medicine that's exactly what we have done. We have a $30 billion a year National Institutes of Health, which has been a remarkable powerhouse of medical discoveries. But we have no National Institute of Health Systems Innovation alongside it studying how best to incorporate these discoveries into daily practice no NTSB equivalent swooping in to study failures the way crash investigators do, no Boeing mapping out the checklists, no agency tracking the month-to-month -month results. The same can be said in numerous other fields. We don't study routine failures in teaching, in law, in government programs, in the financial industry, or elsewhere. We don't look for the patterns of our recurrent mistakes or devise and refine potential solutions for them. But we could, and that is the ultimate point. We are all plagued by failures by missed subtleties, overlooked knowledge, and outright errors. For the most part, we have imagined that little can be done beyond working harder and harder to catch the problems and clean up after them. 
we are not in the habit of thinking the way the army pilots did as they looked upon their shiny new model 299 bomber a machine so complex no one was sure human beings could fly it they too could have decided just to try harder or to dismiss a crash as the failings of a weak pilot instead they chose to accept their fallibilities they recognized the simplicity and power of using a checklist and so can we indeed against the complexity of the world we must there is no other choice when we look closely we recognize the same balls being dropped over and over even by those of great ability and determination we know the patterns we see the costs it's time to try something else Try a checklist.